Yes, Simon Harmer, we're on. So, continuing the conversation. Well, uh, welcome, by the way. Finally made it happen. I know. I got. I put my foot down and got up here. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, glad you mentioned Thomas Partridge before we started, because I was going to ask you about that. And I was what I was going to say to you is, it strikes me as the like your your ambassadorship of a shoe company strikes me as the sort of the one of the best child friendly. Uh, yeah, military black humour things. A bloke who's got no legs, no, no feet. feet, is an ambassador for a, a shoe company. <laughs> How did that come about? <laughs> well, so the boss, um, the guy that owns Thomas Parcher Shoes, and um, he's a cordwainer. And uh, a cordwainer is someone who designs and creates shoes. So you wouldn't call um, a cordwainer a cobbler, and that's no insult to cobblers. Uh, but he he's he's gone to shoe uh, university and he he knows everything about shoes. He wanted to breathe life back into the Thomas Partridge brand. Um, it was a brand that um, went bust in the last century, um, and before that they made shoes and boots uh, as a matter of course. But then obviously the First World War and the Second World War came along and they made boots. Um, for service personnel to wear and you know their boots were worn obviously in the trenches of the first world war i did not know that and later on you know they made um a commando type boot and a de- uh, and a jungle type boot um so paul uh, wanted to to breathe life back into that brand and 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 re-envision it you know make it a lifestyle brand so all the boots are made from um lasts and a last is is um is the it's a it's a a wooden foot for one bit of purposes and that's what you base a shoe on whether it's a a derby shoe um a brogue or a boot whatever it is a, a chelsea boot it comes from a last and last is 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 what um is the shape of the foot that it's made from so he wanted to to, to breathe life back into this brand so I met Paul. Um, he lives in Winchester, but I actually met him through Headley Court when I was when I was there. I was re- rehabbing there. He has very quite, very quietly um, done so much uh, for the veteran community. So he's run the London Marathon in a pair of uh, Thomas Partridge brogues, and he doesn't hang about. Um, he's he's quick. Um, I can be no good for your knees. We just pull that mic down slightly. Just, yeah, a little bit away from me. A little yeah. bit away from me. There. You're, you're booming. You're booming. There you booming. Perfect. Is that there? Um, and then, so he did that, I think, about two or three years ago. And then last year, because he's, he's nuts, he ran the London Marathon dressed as a seven kilo shoe. <laughs> so he got this thing made and uh, produced and he, and, he, and he ran the London Marathon dressed as a shoe. And it was like seven kilos. He couldn't breathe in it properly. And he did this all for um, the livery company that he's associated with in London. And they then donate the money to various different organisations, one of which was Headley Court, uh, Defence Medical Rehabil- Rehabilitation Centre, Headley Court, uh, and, and then Stanford Hall. So he's done sort of on the quiet a lot for the veteran community. And then he's kind of like added to that by employing me. So, you know, for the last sort of two years, I've uh, done all the social media for Thomas Partridge, um, and it is a, sl- a small company. It's a startup. That's not. There's not a lot of us working for the organisation. Um, it's. It might. Mo- it probably takes up um, you know quite a small portion of his time, um, but it's actually something that he's really really passionate about, um, and he wants to extend that. So it's not just employing me. Um, we're also trying to branch off and and uh, and be a little bit more environmentally aware. So I'm based down in Winchester, not far from us in Bournemouth. is a massive um, sort of military surplus company, and it's huge. It's massive. They get stuff from all over Europe. So we went down there. We went and got loads of boots that uh, cannot be nothing can be done with them, and they would end up in landfill. Um, and we've got some other bits and pieces. So we've got some tentage, and the tentage we've got comes from somewhere in Hungary or Germany or somewhere like that. So we got the boots and we took all the, the salvageable leather off them 
and we've got the tents and and we've cut those into pieces and and the tent is has been used in a version of the uh the brogue that he's produced you know about green you know like green canvas army tents yeah right? yeah and that's been built in into the uh into into um a brogue and then we've taken portions of the leather that, that we've retrieved and built that into into shoes as well so it's not the whole shoe it's parts of the shoe because we want to demonstrate that you can still use um you can re- re- recycle and reuse damaged equipment so you know we will sit there taking apart these boots and then like i said parts of that will be used into a new product so the, not the whole shoe is recycled but parts of it are the best we can do so we're just trying to prove a concept and we want to encourage the rest of the industry really to follow suit um and what this what this does is um so we're obviously getting these boots and someone's got to take it apart so our plan this year and covid getting in the way um was to use blesma veterans um and there's a, a few near me um spend a day taking part of these boots which they'll get paid for um and you know so we can use collect all this leather to send off to the factory to be put together into a new shoe a new product um and then along the same lines as as this reusing idea or uh, you know recycling um there's a company that produce uh insoles for the military called Anita. and you saying bolt is he's he's got an interest in this company these insoles um they've been proven to lower uh, leg injury by 66 percent um we're taking all the off cuts and we're using those in the new line of shoe we've got so under the heel um we're building in their what is essentially their waist um into making a more comfortable shoe and but of course you can't sell a shoe to a bloke based on comfort it just doesn't work like that you can't sell a shoe like that um so it's really it's almost it's quite difficult explaining almost but i wear these shoes and i'm not joking these are the most comfortable shoes i've ever worn and i can feel that through my prosthetics so normally i wouldn't be able to i wouldn't be able to knock about in a pair of leather shoes for that long uh these shoes um i can i can wear them probably all day and actually i wore a pair on the uh on the recent advert that I was in uh, for the National Lottery. Oh, I saw that, yeah. I saw that. How did you get the front of the queue there? Bluffer. That's fine. That's a bluffer. <laughs> Do you know what? I just played the card, mate. Disabled card. And just said, you know, cry me a river. It's a good card to play. Yeah. I showed them a disabled badge. They're like, right, you're all over it. We like your face. I mean, it's you could do some makeup, but... No, it was, it was a good gig. And actually, you know, that came from the the network, as it were. So... An amazing woman called uh, uh, Lizzie Nayland. She used to work for Help for Heroes, and she's obviously left and gone to other, you know, uh, different companies. And she contacted me out of the blue, really, and just said, "Oh, you know, there's this project coming up. Would you like to get involved?" I didn't really have any expectation from it. I went down for the shoot, which was down in um, Admiralty Square, down in in London near Woolwich Barracks, um, and I met. You know, I bumped into another of my mates down there, a bloke called Dan Richards, who's an, an amazing bloke. Uh, he's ex-artillery. Um, he's got an amazing story. And, and he's kind of more into that world than I am. Anyway, he sort of basically educated me a little bit on, on what the expectation was. And um, I suppose the rest is history because it's, it's a good advert. Um, you know, I didn't realise how much has been donated from the National Lottery to service charities, but they've done a lot. Do you ever um, just, I'm, I'm not accusing the National Lottery of this, do you ever um, feel like pimped out at all? Or people are, because people can be, especially in business, people can be extremely, they can have extreme lack of empathy. And they see, they see, right, we need, right, we need a, we need a service person. It needs to be an amputee and, uh, and blah, 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 blah. And then, and all of a sudden there's absolutely, they're doing it just because, there's because the, of because of the financial benefit the company's going to, not going to get without any consi- I'm not saying not I'm saying this happens sometimes it must have um, but without any consideration for the emotional impact okay is how can we how can we actually help the people we're going to incorporate into our you know into our campaign whatever they're doing have you ever felt like that at all I'm not I'm not saying that no, the lottery did it at all by the way 
No, and, and actually, if you if you watch that video, not once did they focus on my legs once. And they oh, could have done. They could have. They could have. They could have smashed that, and they didn't. So there's me catching the ball, and of course, you know, um, it's the wrong shape shape ball. So that's why I threw it back again because it was a football. Um, but not <laughs> not once did they did they switch the camera to my legs, and someone else sort of mentioned that, and they were like, "I'm really pleased they didn't do that," because you know they could have done. They could have really sort of. Um, they could have hammered that that side of things, and they didn't. Um, but to answer your question, yeah, there are organisations that do do that, and it's the exploitation that concerns it is. me. It's exploitation because, especially when, and, it, and we could not just talk about amputees, but I think anybody with a, an incapacity in some in some way, shape, or form, uh, quite early on, it it must be a challenge. And I don't know, you're you're the, you're the man. It must be a challenge to to, to understand how how people's perception of you change who don't know you change and how people can like look to exploit we when i say weaknesses I i'm not on about like physically i'm on about uh the the game, misunderstanding almost. of the person who mm. is now in a different position in their life and understand that they're slightly unique and people may want to exploit them for very little or no reward if you like well they'll call it exposure the exposure will do you good but you can't take exposure to the bank you can't feed your kids with exposure um a big um a big company they're sort of a, a financial auditing company um they phoned me up and said uh we would you know we we want you to come do a talk up in birmingham so already in my head i know so what i usually do is plan a day the previous day if i'm going to do a talk the previous day will be purely based on planning of what i'm going to do what i'm going to say and practicing it so they wanted me to drive up to Birmingham, so that's a day's travel, whether I'm going by car or train. And they wanted me to talk in the evening, so it was 6 o'clock in the evening, and then obviously the next day I'd have to drive home. So, and I know myself, the next day I'd be baggage as well. So essentially that's three days out of my life. And when I started talking, you know, I said to them, because I hate this kind of conversation, because being in the military, you're not, you're told your worth, you're not, um, you don't, sort of speak about your worth to other people. You know, every year you get a confidential report um, and you're told your worth. So in the, when you leave the military and then you're exposed to the corporate world, it's very difficult. I still find it uncomfortable. Even sort of, I left in 2014, I still find the conversation really, really difficult. And I said to them, you know, what's your budget? Because um, obviously, you know, this is, this is my job. And they said, oh, um, unfortunately, we can only offer expenses. And I was like, we're having this conversation again, aren't we? In my head. And uh, and I was like, well, this is how I support my family. Um, so you, you want me to come up there uh, and basically for, for nothing, really. I said, well, I'm going to bring my wife with me. So um, can you come down and babysit my kids? the night uh, but unfortunately all i can offer you is expenses to come and do it anyway the conversation kind of went um the way you'd expect and um you know i didn't end up going to do it but actually i'm still a little bit guilty of of of, of saying that i'll do something and my wife going are you getting paid for it and if i go quiet she she knows full well that i'm not getting paid for it it's difficult all right it's it, I, I understand it it's difficult um because on the one hand, you, you were when you were speaking to people, they're getting so much benefit from that. So it's it's you know in that having that hard conversation with that company who don't want to pay you because they they're tight asses and they know exactly what they're doing. At the same time, it's at the expense of the people who could be listening and benefit from what you talk about. Because they they want you there because you you you're inspirationally motivational. You've got a really amazing backstory and you're an amazing guy, and uh, and and that must be part of the the struggle with it. You know sometimes accepting things with what that you, you should be charging for. Yeah. You know, and then, and then, I mean, I've been, it's, it's almost like a sliding scale for, for some stuff I'm paid a couple of hundred quid. Um, and then I've been fortunate enough to be paid quite well for other things, but that is, that is the exception rather than the rule. And that might be every other year where I get like the golden goose, 
you know, so this whole motivational speaking sort of game, uh, it'd be interesting to have a conversation with some of the other guys and, and girls that are doing it. Um, but uh, I don't think people are earning 10 grand a, a gig. If they are, then, well, you know, good on them. But um, that's not my experience. And I don't know. That's just, that's just the way I see it anyway. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a funny old game and, and people do want to take advantage of you. And I, I'll always go out of my way to do stuff for charities, particularly charities like Blesma, who are an incredible charity. They've been there for me from the beginning, very, very quietly as well. Um, they, they aren't based in London, so they don't pay massive rents on, on, on buildings. They've got a small amount of, of staff who are very, very dedicated to that charity. Um, they don't raise a huge amount of money each year, but what they do with that money is they really stretch it and make it work. So I'll always do anything for Blesma because they're such a good organisation and they support so many different things. And actually, I don't know any other charity that um, will... They, they support uh, Making Generation R, which allows... Blesma members to go into schools and deliver workshops in schools based around resilience. So I've done, I've been involved with Making Generation R for probably about four years. Um, I've been to schools, universities. I've been to pupil referral units, which are for kids who have been excluded from mainstream education. Um, I've been all over the country delivering um, workshops uh, to, 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 to loads of kids, as have loads of other Blesma members. And we've hit thousands is generation r the name of the initiative yeah as in r, r for resilience like making yeah making generation r explain to me how the, how what that how, what that looks like what you're communicating the kind of information and lessons you give it so um quite simply i'll go in i'll give a 20 minute um version of of my talk and aimed at the age group that um, i'm speaking to um and then afterwards along with sort of facilitator will then go through a workshop and the workshop will look like um, we'll talk about coping mechanisms. What, um, and that, in fact, to begin with, we'll talk about threats to, 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 to them right now, whether it's social media, peer pressure, um, home life, it could be all sorts of different things. Then we'll talk about coping mechanisms and what, bad coping mechanisms look like um, and what we do is we'll get the kids to we get a massive piece of paper they lie on it and the other kids draw around them and, and then we put different you know different we name the person and we talk about what situation they're going through and then at the end we'll talk about what positive coping mechanism, mechanisms look like and you know for me they're basic like getting outside raising your heart rate a little bit and breathing in the fresh air so you don't have to go and smash out uh, a marathon it could just be walking around the park or even you know dare i say it walking to the park sitting down in the fresh air and then walking back home again it could be as simple as that so that's basically what the, the workshop looks like in a nutshell and of course sometimes it has to be um changed to suit who you're speaking to but you know although it's centered around schools colleges and universities i've also i've been to um hm prison down in swansea and done a talk down there, which was, you know, it was incredible. I was speaking to their their veteran community that were that were in prison there. Um, I've also spoken spoken to the National Health Service quite a lot, and and you know, my former life being a medic, that kind of um, that uh, dovetails in quite quite nicely. Um, and then we've also spoken to um, you know uh, the fire brigade uh, around the UK as well. So there's different strings to the making genera making generation resilient sort of bow, as it were. It's a it's a and that's that's run by the Drive Project, but it's supported financially by Blesma, and they pay us to do it. And they are the only charity, in my knowledge, that will pay their beneficiaries to do something. And it's not a huge amount of money, but it's the acknowledgement of your time, um, your effort and your ability and for me um it's a nice to have but for some people it's it's almost essential 
So you're promised about six gigs a year. So you might, and you might get more than that, but that amount, that, that small amount of money, um, could be life changing for some of the other Blizzard members. And it's an acknowledgement of, of your worth. And that is so important. And my experience with some of the other charities where I was delivering, um, similar sort of mo you know speaking at different events and bits and pieces i did feel wheeled out um i did feel really taken for granted for particularly then when i was escorted there by um a member of the charity who was getting paid and everybody else in the room was getting paid apart from muggins who was just kind of wheeled out and you know that it goes back to what you're saying earlier on I, I was exploited a little bit i felt exploited and um it got um it got hard to do in the end i couldn't do it anymore but what blesmer are doing is 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 incredible to be honest with you mate i, I haven't heard of that i hadn't heard of that generation i initially before and i really like the sound of it it's brilliant. One, one of the things i've been i've been paying a lot of put a little a, a relatively lot of thought into just you know motorway driving right and <laughs> throwing public mad is the is obviously on the mental health side of things, but just general mental health of the pop, the UK population, and and wider maybe, and how we improve it. We, how we generally bring up the the average state of mental health in the UK. How do we do it? And and, and I don't mean now. I mean in the long run. And I think the one of the gaps that we all have, everybody has. We. You and I are probably more knowledgeable than most people in the UK on the subject of mental health, how it impacts you positively and negatively, and what tools there are to to help you cope with or improve your, your mental health or your mental ability at, at specific times or generally. I need to I need to prepare a speech, for example. I need to do some I need to do some revision. I I've got a difficult meeting to go to. I've got a family event that I have to go to. I don't want to deal with. I've got a funeral to go to. You know, set yourself up to, for challenges that are coming up as in specific examples, and then just generally bringing, you know, improving, improving your mental health. And I think the, the, the reason is, uh, it's not as good as it can be at the moment is just the knowledge that people have. The, one, the awareness of it, the literally the consciousness of their mental state and two are the tools that there are available. When I say available, it's like you were saying, mate. little things like I say it all the time. I hate, I hate repeating myself. Because people listen to the podcast regularly, just like, he's banging on about getting outside again and going for a walk. He's banging on about that again. It's, but it's one. It's free, one, exactly. And it's one of the examples, right? Um, but to improve that knowledge, you have to start at, at at the school level, at the child level, in the home, but also in school. One of the things I really think would be really good to bring in, so simple, wouldn't cost anything, would be at the start of each lesson, right? Every lesson, and start this in primary school. Start of each lesson. There is a two minute or a three minute meditation session, right? And that is not me saying everyone should meditate all the time uh, because it doesn't work for everyone. It benefits people in different different ways. But at a school, at a child level, one, it introduces them to that meditation. Two, in the practical sense, it switches their brain off from the previous lesson, resets it, gets them ready for the next lesson. And three, it introduces them to the benefits of changing your mental state and how easy it is to do. And in this case, they're doing it with meditation. Why do I say meditation? Because it's two or three minutes of sitting down and doing nothing. Right, class, shut your mouth, shut your eyes, three minutes, that's it. Doesn't even have to be guided. Just that's it. Do three minutes of silence. Shut the F up, Johnny, or you're always winding me up. But you know, that, that's it. Imagine doing that every lesson. You At the end of just primary school, or even just doing it for one term, those kids, they'd be exposed to meditation, they'd be exposed to changing their mental states. I guarantee you, they'll be more responsive in those lessons each time they reset their brains they're more alert like they, they, their brains clear going into that you know going from religious education into i don't know history whatever it is just as an example and that's why this generation r thing they see it sounds really 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 positive to me if the government should should absolutely make it part of the curriculums in all schools and all educational establishments that there is mental health on there whether that's its own standalone lesson whether it's 30 minutes a week well, but it needs to be regular and frequent because when those people become going to college or uni or adults, they're going to be much more resilient, much more resilient. And what does that mean? More resilient people, less ill health, less physical ill health, less mental ill health, less strain on the NHS, less cost to the UK taxpayer, less impact on the government. 
and what, and less less cost to the government means what? More money for the government, exactly, more money for yeah. the UK. It's uh, it's like a no brainer. <laughs> we just fixed it, mate. When I left the military, <laughs> I left in 2004, and I want to do something completely. This will make you laugh. I want to do something completely removed from anything that I've experienced in the military. And I did uh, a course in hypnotherapy, hypnotherapy, um, hypnotherapy counselling, or whatever you, I can't even pronounce it anymore. But hypnotherapy, hypnotherapeutic counselling. Yeah, that's it. Is it? Okay. Yeah. No, so hypnotherapy is hypnotherapy isn't what you see on the TV. You cannot make someone do something they really don't want to do. Hypnotherapy in its, in its purest form is, um, say, for example, you drive to work on a, on, a, on a route that you go every day. And when you stop driving and you get out, you go, oh, I can't really remember. I can't remember getting here. That is hypnotherapy in its purest form. If you're going to run uh, and you're lost in the moment, that is a form of hypnotherapy. Um, Expl- explain that. Explain how it's... So I, I use it as a technique now to get to sleep. Uh, and I, I, I used to uh, lie in bed and think about that, the, uh, the, the 100 things I hadn't done, the 100 things I need to do. Obviously, I used to think about the zombie apocalypse because that's going to happen one day and making plans for that. It's happening. It's, it's going to happen. It's happening right now. You know, so... Um, hypnotherapeutic counselling for me the one takeaway that I got for that was um, how I could get myself to sleep and the way I do it now is I clear my mind and think about the one place I'd love to be and for me it's on top of a mountain looking down this into this valley and in the distance I can see the sea because obviously I can't fucking climb mountains anymore well I suppose I could do if I could be bothered if I could be bothered um, so I used to, I used to love all that. I used to love mountain climbing or, you know, whatever, hill walking, whatever you want to call it. And, and so I think about this, this sort of image in my head and it doesn't take me for lo- long to get to sleep. And for most people, if you say, what's the one place you'd love to be, it will be on a beach listening to the waves. That's where they'd love to be. And so actually all it is doing is clearing your mind and thinking about one thing. So it's kind of like, I suppose you could equate it to, oh, go and count sheep, because it's clean. I mean, that works for no one, because why would anybody want to watch sheep count sheep? Why would they want to do that? That's that's kind of the cliched thing you're told to go and do. But hypnotherapeutic counselling, um, they've kind of proved it as well, where they have got someone to go through, um, uh, you know, a 20-minute guided session and they've connected them up. They've connected them both up to, to brain monitors to see what they're doing. And it, these, the person that's receiving the treatment and the person that's giving the treatment, their brain waves start to have a similar... Um, they, they start to sink. So there's got to, there, there, there's got to be something into it. You know, it's not um, the, the cliché thing of, right, I'm going to make you bark like a dog and and do something stupid on stage. That is a complete cliche. What it is, is about um, changing your perception by, um, by I suppose, layering your subconscious. Layering your subconscious. Go yeah. On. You know, so I know people that, I couldn't do this, um, but people have been helped um, to give up smoking or to lose weight or... Um, actually, you know, you can, you can guide someone through what it's going to be like to, you know, during childbirth and they can be given techniques, breathing techniques and bits and pieces like that. So hypnotherapeutic counseling, there's, there's a lot in it and, and I'm no way an expert and I don't know all of it. And actually my only takeaway was how to get to sleep at night. And, um, just purely that alone, um, I was worth doing the course for me. And I just want to do something that was random and probably a little bit hippie-ish. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, it's, it just changes your mental state, right? So, I think of this. The hypnotherapy is changing your mental state, but by, by and doing it by getting you to focus on something that isn't real, mm. kind of. Yeah. And, you know, when I swim, and obviously I swim a lot, and, 
um, I probably reach a, a, a probably a, a similar situation where I'm head down in the water and I come out with amazing ideas, which I then forget soon after I've got out of the water. But what I haven't got in front of me is that screen or any anybody else in my ear bothering me for that hour I'm in the water. And, you know, I'm looking into the water. I only, I only look out of the water to breathe. Uh, and if I'm doing the cold water swimming, then I've, it's even, it's even I'm, I'm going deeper because actually I've really got to concentrate, one, on what I'm doing with where I'm going, what, how I'm swimming, but also really concentrate on what I feel inside because I don't want to get to a position where I can't either get out of the water or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm baggage and I can't sort myself out. So, um, you know, I, I've swam to, uh, you know, probably the colds that have gone is about five of just over five degrees. And you've got to be really self-aware about what you're doing at that temperature. And, um, you've got to know yourself and know your body and you've got to be able to plan that you're going to be able to get out of the water safely and get yourself warm and dry afterwards. Yeah. The, 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 the depth of thoughts are really interesting one there. And it's, uh, it's something that I sort of relearned over the last, over the pandemic, actually, what the, the, this is bit, like the lockdown was one of the most beneficial things for me has been since I left the military, believe it or not. Um, and there's a, like a, especially when you're talking about the swimming, you, you, you got, there's no sensory inputs, you, your brain, and that is it. And I got into the habit as probably most people who go running who are, and who go running or do any kind of fitness like that, maybe not swimming, you can get those waterproof earbuds though, can't you? But, but like running definitely or in a gym, it's like a, the default is to get some headphones in, put some music on. Or what I was doing was I listened to podcasts, very rarely music podcasts. And then I decided, I can't remember why, I think it was along the line, it was to do with just my experiences with meditation, experiences with just um, practicing, focusing without any, without anything. Like I've mentioned before, getting in the sauna. I like to go in the sauna for 20 minutes. And I go in there and I decided I was going to double up and meditate in there. And I would do that by counting the 1200, 1200 seconds in 20 minutes. So I wouldn't look at the clock. I'd close my eyes and I'm conscious about my posture because I get bad back sometimes. And I try and sit in the correct posture. And the aim being, right, you're going to try and count the 1200 and one, two, at the cadence of one second every time and see how long, one, I see how long I can go before I need to break my posture. Because when you're not used to sitting yeah. properly, it's really sore. And then two, is see how long I can go without opening my eyes or getting uncomfortable because it is not comfortable in a hot sauna, like 90 degrees-ish. Um, and, the, and while I was doing that, as time went on, m muscle memory, if you like, but brain muscle memory, I was able to count not always at 1200, I would usually get to about 800 or 900, break my posture, and then maybe open my eyes, right? But my brain would be automatically counting. I wouldn't even be thinking about the counting. And it would be doing it, mate. It'd be crazy how, how amazing the brain is. I would get to 1200 and look at the clock. And I would usually, almost always, in fact, I think every time, was within 30 seconds to a minute That's of amazing. 20 minutes bang on. Yeah, it is. it's amazing. But I've done it loads and loads and loads and loads, right? Um, and I started off, I'd only get five minutes. I'd just been even sitting in a sauna, never mind doing it for 20 minutes. But my brain got into autopilot and counting for me without me having to think about it. I It allows the brain to do other things. And I started doing that in the running. I started leaving my head when I started getting back into running properly again at the start of COVID. That, you know, get outside, you load one activity a day. I thought I'm going to make the most of this. And I went out every day, really got back into my running. And I went, started going out without headphones in. And exactly like you said, man, ideas, different different viewpoints onto issues or situations or stuff that's going on. And th they were amazingly beneficial, whether it's a 20 minute run or an hour, amazingly beneficial. And even if I didn't have any ideas or anything like that, or like, like, ah, eureka moments, which happened on most of the runs, I certainly came off them. And I was like, my, just felt better. One, because I, the physical activity, but two, because my brain, I had nothing to worry about. Not phone, not laptop, nothing like that, just focusing on running. And, and what it does is it allows you those situations where you're, you're not bombarding yourself with inf outside information. It allows us now to do that thing, which very, very few people do is go depth of thought, just one level down, yeah. you know, one level down from your normal conscious state, one level down and think a little bit more about that conversation you had with your, that family member earlier in the day. Think a bit more about the issue you got with work. Think a bit more a bit about what you want to do the rest of the day, what you want to do for the week, what you're doing in life. It just, we, we've lost that with the advent of smart technology, 100%.
And I think one well, that is a really big impact on on uh, on society, just mentally, you know, um, well being in a well being um, sense, uh, sense is a huge thing because we never we never address in our our emotions and our mental state. We're not doing it anymore. We used to. We don't do it anymore. Nah. Is the, is mental health? Uh, is generally? I don't know if you know. I'll have to Google this after. I don't know. Is is the mental health of the nation? Is it taken a, a decline over the last six seven years? I'd love to look at that data. I'd also want to see how uh, what uh, what divorce rates have been like since two thousand seven two thousand eight when social media started hitting. Yeah, <laughs> I reckon they've gone up. Do you know what? It's funny with the old. Uh, I remember when I first got to Headley Court, and um, because a lot of us had been thrown. They were obviously concerned about mild traumatic brain disorders. and Because a lot of you have been what? We'd been thrown when we got blown up and we landed on our, you know, we landed on our heads or we were, the, la- the way we landed, you know, we would have rattled inside our helmets. Well, you can, you, can get t- you can get TBI from just the blast without even being thrown. Yeah. Did you, I don't know if you're aware, I had a, a lady called Mandy Bostwick on, on number 99 and she's a, she's a uh, specialist trauma psychotherapist. Uh, did you listen to that one? Yeah. Not? You did? Uh, no, I haven't listened to that one. I've downloaded it, but I haven't listened okay, to yeah. it. Okay, yeah. Well worth listening to because it's specifically about, or well, almost entirely about the impact of blast traumatic brain injuries on people uh, and the, the physiological impact, neurophysiological impact, and how that is attributable to many, many mental health disorders that ex-military people are facing. Yeah. Um, it, you, it's, it is, it's a bit of a frustrating listen to some times because pe- people in significant parts of governmental organizations ain't listening to what's being said and so people are getting treated properly but it, it, she does a really good job explaining what you what you're talking about there the, the uh mental the brain the brain disorders and those those blasts and explosions but it was funny when i when i when i first got there i had to go for my first meeting and i, I was in a wheelchair uh so i wheeled myself down and um i was 33 so I'd had a little bit of life when I got hit. Um, and I was presented by three sort of paper questionnaires. And after the third time I'd been asked, do I want to self-harm or do I want to commit suicide? I was a bit pissed off, to honest with you. And, and I thought to myself, that some of the younger lads might answer these questions to avoid um the negative answer so they might be ans- they might answer these questions just to to basically get past this these these questionnaires because i thought i was going to go down, down and have a conversation and have a chat with somebody an experienced um psychologist who was going to assess me to see if i needed any further treatment anyway i wheeled myself back up to um um the ward uh, the peter long ward and uh, I went and spoke to the nurses. And in a really matter-of-fact voice, I said, I'm really angry because... And I explained why I was angry. But they didn't hear what I said. They just heard that I was angry. So I was back down there the next day for anger management. <laughs> and I, and they, they, they didn't kind of, like, listen to what I was saying. Um, they, just, they just heard the words I said, but they didn't kind of, like, unravel what I was saying. But... Uh, Anyway, I went back down and and I had to go through this anger management, um, these anger management sessions. What were they like? Well, I explained to them. I said to them, "Look, the reason why I'm at, I'm down here is is because of this." I said, "I'm worried that some of the guys are gonna are gonna kind of um, miss out on treatment because the way that they're being assessed." Um, and perhaps I was wrong. You know, perhaps I was wrong in 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 my sort of basic assessment what i saw was something wrong but um you know i just didn't want blokes missing out on treatment really and and um and i don't know perhaps i went about it the wrong way i don't know but i wasn't it was funny because i wasn't angry i just said i just said those words i am angry in that tone of voice as well i didn't start like um you know shouting and and banging my hand on the table i was like oh i'm really angry right Get yourself back down there because you're going down for anger management. So there it was. There yeah. it was down there. Yeah, those those questionnaires. They were. Uh, like, I think they start. They have. Well, the, 
I think this, you know, they started, when I say they, the Royal Day, just people in general, organisation in general, not just charities, but those kind of questionnaires are done by, like, you know, corporates as well, trying to understand sort of the, you know, the, the what the state of the, the workforce is like, aren't they? But I think they've, they're starting to move away from the direct questions to asking lots of other questions, which are quite easy to answer, to again, to make, put it into some matrix to make up, oh yeah, the work the, the workforce is they're positive and they're, they they feel respected and you know, and all that same with the charities isn't it but because the problem with some of those questions is it's like it's so hard to answer and it's subjective and, con- and it's how yeah. you interpret what they say so for no example context. how how happy how um do, on a scale of one to ten how happy do you feel how uh yeah how how rewarded do you feel in life today it's like well what's ten is that is that everyone ringing me out every two seconds going, you're amazing, Hugh. And what's zero? It's like people telling me you're an arsehole. And that's how I interpret, the, I would interpret the question. And then, and then it depends on how I'm feeling that day. Yeah. The day I'm actually recording the answer, because I could be six days out of seven. Yeah, mega. And then that day, I've had a real crap day. And I'm going, oh my God, I feel fucking terrible. And you're putting a two in it. You know, it's, a bit, it's yeah, yeah, difficult. Well, you, can it's, wake it's, up, it's, you can wake up in the morning and happy as Larry. And then something might happen during your... your you know, by the time you get to work, you're pissed off, and then it is a two. I, I had, I had, uh, I got some got a couple of really good friends, Luke and Lucy, Luke and Lucy in London, and um, there's been there was one uh, day, one night, and I ended up I was in I was in Tatters, I was in Tatters, and I ended up with the phone to them, and they said, and it was late at night, might have been early hours, and they were like, come here. Drive you, drive you now. I was in absolute tatters on the phone, like in just despair. And I drove to them, and and I, I got there and I, I, I walked into their living room, and they're like, and they're like right, I'm like yeah. And like, I, I wasn't, I was in complete tatters, but, but at the point I walked in there, because I was all of a sudden around my mates, and I knew there was no, you know, I could be completely trusting of them, and there was no prejudgments or anything like that and i was absolutely fine and it's like and you could see it, it was sort of they were thinking yeah you're that bad like what? What's wrong? What's uh, yeah, but i was i was feeling so good i was like i was smiling exactly like, i'm laughing back it's like and you can't control that it's almost right. like well, should i pretend to be yeah you know, should i pretend to be emo- you know, like, like i was an hour ago and i was in clip but i was just so happy to see them and again that's just an example of how things can change so quickly depending on the situation you you know you pres- presented with is really it's really difficult subjective that and that is a demonstration of how much of a challenge it is for charities to deal with flipping lunatics like us yeah <laughs> and actually I, I had a shimp this morning so i found i found up my mate andy uh andy from facebook andy mylock good lad isn't he? amazing he, bloke. He, he was he came on the podcast yeah mega bloke yeah, yeah. yeah. hey a man that never ages i know <laughs> benjamin button that guy oh, yeah no, he's. Uh, I phoned him up this morning, and and obviously we've started this, this not for profit. Um, Mike Alf. Yeah, and uh, and actually that was born out of a little bit of frustration of myself leaving the military a little bit. So obviously Andy was in Royal Green Jackets, um, and he's left the military a long time ago. Um, gone around the hours, he's gone to New Zealand, put himself through uh, university found an iron so he can iron his clothes because um, obviously, the, you know, green jackets aren't, they don't know about irons. Um, and, uh, you know, he's he's doing an amazing job with with Facebook. And, and then I did a gig for Facebook last year, actually with Making Generation R. Um, and he said to me, oh, you know, we really hit it off. Straight away we hit it off. And he said, oh, I want to make this organisation he said, I don't know what it looks like yet, but I want to involve you. And I was like, ah. Oh. And, you know, and, and then at the end of last year, it kind of, he'd done all this background work and it was re- it was good to go. So basically with Mike Alpha, it's, um, it's trying to encourage people uh, from the military and from, well, in fact, from the whole community, really, uh, to get involved in digital marketing. Well, the whole community. My girlfriend was on the webinar yesterday. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, something that struck me was actually there was nothing for spouses. So when I got injured, my wife really didn't get anything at all. Um, 
and she was kind of forgotten about. And she's actually the one that sacrificed, I think, the most. Um, you know, she lost her career, and you could argue anybody could argue this, but she, she could have gone back into work. Um, but then I kept on getting her pregnant, and um, you know, clearly we should have bought a TV for Christmas <laughs> or a bigger TV. I don't know. Um, uh, anyway, so you know. Although I got compensated from what happened to me, it didn't compensate me for what my wife went through. And of course, the MOD and the military and the, and the army can't compensate that. It'd be ridiculous to even expect it. But um, I think spouses and partners um, and probably a little bit of mum and dads have, have, have been forgotten. All the carers, the immediate carers have been forgotten about this process. They've been forgotten about in this whole process. So it's really important to me that... Um, that spouses are involved in the Mark Alpha program. You know, so we've we've run three courses. One's been a physical course. Um, we've run two further uh, virtual courses because obviously COVID's got in the way of everything and messed up a lot of plans. And then we've also started to to roll out some webinars as well. Um, and you know, this is a hobby for me and Andy. We're not benefiting from this in any way. Um, but you know, we. Andy and myself really want to give the the opportunity for people to 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 learn some new information and use it for their small business or to go into the industry. Um, you know, and some of the spouses have already got jobs in in uh, as social media managers in in different organisations. So, you know, we really proved the concept and and we want it to go from strength to strength. It's a it's I'm really excited about Mark Alpha and what it can do. Yeah, it seems really cool, mate. And just again, Andy, what a fucking legend! I, that guy, you know, he's a, he's one of these people. He's so modest with it. Uh, what about what he does? He does a huge amount. Yeah, uh, he does, and that's through Facebook and also other things. Mike Alpha being an example, a fucking brilliant guy. And I've not known him a long time. Um, so I don't know. I might discover he's a bit of a balance, but <laughs> <laughs> I haven't yet. No, I'm joking, Andy. You mega. No, yeah, Mike Alpha. Um, it's interesting. One of the, I mean, this is one of the things. We're very entrepreneurial, aren't we? Ex-military folk. Uh, I think, generally speaking, really entrepreneurial because, well, for, for whatever reason. And one of the things, one of the misconceptions, I think, is when, you, when you're when embarking on a new venture, be that a not-for-profit, be that a crowdfunding, you know, you're going to do raise a bit of money for charity or be that an actual, an actual business, a profit-making business. It seems that social media is an easy thing to do. Yeah. And it's very easy to do at a very, very, very basic level. It is very difficult, I think, to do without any educational training on it. Very difficult to do effectively. I'm learning that. I'll be on. I'll be getting on one of those Mike Alpha courses hundred percent. I'm learning that just from the podcast side of things. Um, it is hard, and uh, but we don't. I think we just we, we we're late to the party to realise that sometimes. So Mike Alpha looks amazing, and the missus has been on a couple of webinars now. I've not. I've, I've missed. I've missed the two I wanted to get on. But um, she, she says it's really good. And who was it? We oh, I think Nick Goldsmith, Hidden Valley Bushcraft, has been on. Was one of the five day courses, wasn't he? Um, I'm not sure if he's been on. I can't even remember if Louise has been on. Oh, I think this is Louise. Yeah. But you know, um, I just think it, it's it's another string to to add to people because we don't want it. We don't ever want to charge the veterans. That's never going to happen. And these courses are, you know. We're really lucky because uh, jellyfish who are delivering the training for us, they are subject matter experts. And it's not the the usual British chip shop version of, of what good looks like. They are elite. They really are good at what they do. So their trainers are, they're not just um, people that are read, they've, they, they've worked in the industry and they've delivered um campaigns for huge organizations so they know what they're talking about they really do and their courses are, are expensive courses um and they've they've given jellyfish have given us that training for free we're never gonna it's never gonna be um we're never gonna take money off a veteran or a service leaver or a spouse we're always going to find a way for that to be paid um and that's our next challenge really and, and again covid's gotten away of this a little bit and we're also going to try and find a way um, where if it's needed to pay for travel and accommodation, because sometimes that's a block for people to to to, to join courses or to, to get training. Um, 
and actually the virtual system has worked quite well. And we're also, Andy's, you know, looking about getting um, sort of a home course where you can just do the course on yourself in your own time. And, um, you know, if, with backup if you need it, you know. So there's going to be different ways to access the training. So just, just some clear in my mind. Mike Alpha is basically teaching people how to use social media more effectively. Is it in a, in a, in one sentence? Right? Yeah. Um, but also the bolt on of being able to get um, a mentor and mentorship is something that I don't think is used enough in the UK because having a mentor and being a mentor makes you a better, a better human. Because if you're mentoring someone, I'm sorry, I'm going to go off on a tangent now, but go if you're it. mentoring so someone, you're actually having to give your A game every time you go into, into work. If you're being a mentor, you're learning from someone who's giving their A game. And actually, everybody should be mentoring at every single level. And I think this is something that's missing from perhaps the, um, the you know, the officer corps, I've got it squared away. They can, they, they've they got degrees, maybe. They've got A-levels, maybe. And there's a, there's a lot less of them. And, and of course, it, I think it is a little bit easier for them. But I think that the, you know, the rest of us, the ORs, the ordinary ranks, we should, we should be mentoring each other. And it's something we probably don't do enough of and we probably don't think about doing it enough. We should be mentoring people that are leaving the military um, and we should be mentoring those that have just left the military. There should be a whole procession of, of, of us being mentored and being mentored um, and being mentors. Uh, and anyway, so Mike Alpha is going to deliver that part of um, – as a as a package so you can get a mentor to to tell you what, you what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong and if it's required we're also going to find a way to place people as well again this is this has been held back a little bit just because of covid at the moment but there will be a way to access um placement or internships and maybe even work at some point as well yeah the the the, the mentor and mate i completely agree uh so mike the company i work for in, in marsat they they have a a mentorship program there in, internally. I think it's relative. I'm not involved directly in it, but I think it's quite informal, but it, it's a really positive thing. It's, I think it's, and I think it might just be for the, the graduates or their undergraduates who are there. Um, but it works really well. And I, I agree, in, like in, in, especially in like, the entrepreneurial side. The people who have mentors are very lucky. They may not even realise they're mentors. You know, it's that mate who's got more business acumen or arguably, you know, Mike Valancey you just met, who's, you know, a, a, a sort of a, men, a mentor to me on the you know, the business side and especially on the on the charity side you know on that on the and and keeping maintaining the right direction in what you what you're aiming to do um whether it be that charitable or a business sense um but yeah the the placements will be good i had some conversations with andy last year where i, I must sat when a, a friend of my good friend and um paul Godonis was still working there. We were talking around this kind of stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm confident that uh, that'll, that'll be possible. Did, has he mentioned that to you? We should talk after this, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mentioned conversations. We talked as in involving in Marsat in some capacity. Yeah. Um, and there were positive conversations, but obviously Paul ended up leaving in Marsat and, and uh, COVID amp. <laughs> but, you know, this, <laughs> you know, obviously we're never going to charge uh, veterans for this training, but um, perhaps it will be uh, rolled out to other interested parties at some point, which they'll have to pay, but it will be to pay to support the veteran, sort of the veteran community spouse. And, and even um, if dependents, if it suits a dependent, because obviously, you know, we, again, we just don't want this training to, um, we want it to be completely inclusive um, for the whole veteran community. So partners of, and and dependents, if if it fits the the right criteria, then dependents as well. But what we don't want is people just jumping on the training or the course that just fancy a free course. So there's got to be um, a relevance. So whether you're running a small business or you want to go into the industry, it's not just oh I fancy a free course because these courses are are valuable and you know we are filling every single space, every single course we are filling the spaces. Are you are you guys registered with Veteran Owned UK? Oh yeah, we know Scott. Okay, I mean, uh, who doesn't know Scott? Okay, so are you registered with Veteran Owned? Um, on there, I don't know. Okay, it says on there because um, one of the things I'm about to do literally this week is so obviously I have sponsors of the podcast. So on the audio version, for people watching watching this on YouTube, 
on the audio version at the start and at the end is sponsorship plugs the people who sponsor the rugby heroes and the aardvark group are two of my sponsors at the moment what i want to i've got space for others so what i what i'm going to do is i'm going to i'm going to offer up free basically free advertising space on the podcast for veteran-owned businesses i'm going to do it for probably three or four months so I, a business will get free sponsorship on here for a, for a month and one that uh, that gives me data to like sort of demonstrate the impact that the podcast can have for sponsors you know um in terms of benefit they get but two it's also going to give those businesses who get that free sponsorship it's going to give them an insight into how impactful advertising on podcasts are because podcasts are like a it's a, it's a relatively new thing right and it's a really different it's really difficult as i understand this now from my own it's very very difficult to try and demonstrate to a potential sponsor um the value of uh, how valuable are the, are the roi they're going to get from yeah. advertising start because traditionally the f- where's the first people, place people go when they want to look at how big an, how how much reach an organization has got they go to social media right and one of the things i've noticed with especially with h hour is the social media the, the the appearance of social media as in the followers and all that's got is not representative of the the reach it has because nah. because re- man i mean there's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of listeners to the podcast but it's not thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of like followers on social media um and and so that's what i want to use this thing for give give some companies some free veteran owned companies some free advertising also get more knowledge of the impact of it myself and they can understand then because it may not work for them you know it may not be the right space for them to advertise in, but at least they'll know in a in a, in a, a medium that is relatively um, uh, relatively not misunderstood. It's not fully understood yet. Yeah, you know. And again, like I said, it would be good for me to be able to demonstrate how how positive it is because I know when I mean Westway aren't sponsors anymore, unfortunately. Um, but and that's due to they've had a, a big impact. The COVID hit bad, um, so they're peeling back the costs. But man. Sold a lot of cars for them. <laughs> yeah. I say yes, mate. Yes. Sold was, a lot of cars for Westway, just off saying Westway at the start of every podcast. Well, I mean, even, it, was a, it was a pleasure. Even the MOTs, well, you know, I know that the MOTs, you've got like a year's worth of uh, RAC cover. I mean, that's that's not to be sniffed at, is yeah. it? Yeah. And what's an MOT, like 50 quid? Yeah. If, yeah. if that. Yeah. Um, they should never, they shouldn't have switched off. They shouldn't have switched it off. But I think, and for, mate, they, they also switched off, sponsor, they switched off all their sponsorship most of the sponsorship stuff because they were sponsoring the red devils as well weren't they and they switched that off really yeah they switched that off now i should i should caveat this with my good friend tony lewis who was the uh, md at westward list now he is not there and he was not there when these decisions were made yeah so red devils sponsorship switched off hr sponsorship switched off and whatever else it's a shame a real shame um and i hope they because it's a shame because it support the veteran community military veteran community the military community i hope they switch it back on when um when things you know turn turn back they have an upturn in business and stuff. But, uh, well, you know, a good example of like um, podcasts and social media, because social media and, and podcasts kind of go hand in hand a little bit. And uh, there's always a little example I like. You know Sophie Turner, who played Santa Stark? Big fan. Big fan. Don't tell so, the missus. Don't tell the missus. I'm a big fan of Sophie Turner, yes. Yeah, so she obviously got the job <laughs> in Game of Thrones. Do you, know, do you know how she got that job? And this is in her own words. The reason why she got that book, got job is because she had a bigger following on Instagram. And that she said there's better actresses and actors that went for that part. And the reason why she got that job is because she had a bigger following on social media. I can believe it. I can believe it because it's, it, and it makes sense. It's, I mean, people, probably a generation below us are going, yeah, well, that's fucking obvious. Yeah. You know, it's like, not a generation below, but maybe five, 10 years ago, that's, that's a bit obvious. But yeah, it makes sense because it's more exposure for the documentary mm. or the production or the film or whatever is being done. Yeah, you know, and, and another example. So on the on the webinar yesterday, something that I'm I was this. So the webinar yesterday was all about to maximising employee sort of advocacy on LinkedIn, and so as an example, Jellyfish will put out a post, and um, people may or may not um, sort of interact with that post however the employees it's not something that they're told to do from jellyfish but they'll get onto it that if it's something that's relevant to their niche or as the americans say niche and it's freaking niche stop ruining the language um they'll repost that post with their own 
take on what that means. And because, and and it's clear, so the post will get like 10 likes. When it's reposted with a person's interpretation of that post, it times it by 10. The one, how many people are seen, see it. And also the uplift in um, engagement to that post, whether it's comments, likes, whatever it is that goes on. Um, so, you know, again, with podcasts, sometimes you can't necessarily see the benefit unless it's actually a sale or a buy or whatever it is. Um, but I think it's all, it's there. It's definitely there. Oh, it is definitely there. The other one is, I mean, the other, like anomaly with po- with podcasts is, <clears throat> oh, no, let, the other anomaly is another traditional place people go when they want to see what, what the, in, what, how big a reach an organization has or whatever, or a person has, is they go to the website look at the website data. And that's another anomaly with podcasts. So if you go to, so one of the things you like to look at, and you, if you're a business, you get a website, you like to look, you want like to know how many, how many return visitors are there, how many people have visited your website and then they've come back. So, you know, 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%, whatever. How that's one of the statistics, how often they come back. Well, for a podcast, for example, if someone finds my podcast via Google search and they end up on the website, charliecharlie1.com, then they find the podcast, right? But then all the webs on the website, all the links, iTunes link, Google podcast link, YouTube link, Spotify link and all that. They click onto that. What do they do then when they start listening to the podcast? They use one of those apps. They don't go, they don't go to the website every time. They go and now they listen to the podcast on Spotify because it's subscribed or iTunes, Apple podcasts, because that's where it's subscribed. They don't go back to the website. There's no need. Yeah. So that yeah, yeah, just yeah. on a podcast front, it's no, no, that's irrelevant. And again, I've put sponsorship decks together, a deck, together before and it's a real challenge in it to go look because i like to put the statistics in there it's tr- trying to explain you know the the return visitors to the website is small this is why it's a small percentage much lower than what a normal organ- organization would be other than podcast this is why because people don't need to go back they don't consume the fucking podcast on charlie every time i don't i go on google podcasts yeah. i found you know a veteran state of mind i found that on its website and i've been i've been the website once ever I still listen to Veteran State of Mind, you know, as an example. It's difficult. But again, and going back to just, I guess it's sort of similar to Mike Alpha in a way. I just, it's, we have, we have knowledge. We're very lucky. We have a reach to the veteran community, military community, and it's just sort of sharing that information. Yeah. Just trying, just try and communicate it, especially on the business front. Business is so fucking hard. Yeah. And getting ahead on social media is so difficult. The more help, the better. And help normally costs a bomb. Yeah. And that's why it would always be free. And, 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 I put a post out on Instagram yesterday because sometimes I get a little bit frustrated. Like I, anger management, you need to go back to anger do, management. Mate. Are you angry? No, I'm. I'm not angry. I'm. F- I'm raging, mate. Raging. <laughs> I think we can do more to help each other. Like, and if that means, um, even if you don't like someone, or if you don't like what they've got to sell, or if I don't care, I'll just go. If I see something and if I see a veteran's doing it, I'll go and buy it. I might not like it. I might not ever open their book that they've just sold me. But I want to show, I want to demonstrate, I want to support the community as best I can. So I'll go and buy the coffee. And of course, I'll drink all the coffee. Uh, I'll go and buy the t-shirts. And, and you know, one of my favorite brands at the moment is uh, Cineas Guild. I love just even, just to, I just love everything about it. Honestly. You're going to get a tap? Um, my wife won't let me. She's like that. She won't let me. I just don't want to be a disappointment. <laughs> moving, moving swiftly on. Yeah. Um, I just think we could do more, like, uh, as a community, we could do more to support each other rather than um, worrying about how successful people are. I think we, if we build each other up, uh, you know, we rise by building each other up. So if I'm helping, I don't know, Jordan Wiley, for example, and He's an amazing bloke and I'm proud to know him. Um, I'll do everything I can to support him. So he is obviously doing his paddle around the UK at the moment on a, on a, on a sup, on a stand-up pedal board. The man's bonkers. Did um, you see that picture he put out yesterday, the day before? On, the, on the board. Stand-up paddle board. I think it's in the Irish Sea. Yeah, on and the back of it. Uh, no, no. I couldn't even see the board because the size of the waves. I could just see his chest. That yeah. wave, there's a wave in front. He's meant, They're meant I mean, to. he's... What he's undertaking, I think... It's it's um it's incredible what he's doing. Um 
but I wanted to demonstrate his benefit to a company that was supporting him. So he's dealing with uh, Red Original and that he's given them, you know, they've supported him um, on on his journey. Red Red Original. Yeah. yeah. They're like a, a, a stand-up pedalboard company and they've got some they've got some pretty awesome kit gear actually. Um and stuff that I can use as an open water swimmer. Anyway, I wanted to show um a value to them that had been delivered by him. So I just went on their website and just went and bought something. Just because I wanted to so to show that that he was valuable to them in some way. Um I, you know, I didn't tell my wife that because she'd have gone she'd have gone mental. Uh but um yeah, I always I I try desperately to 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 support stuff, even if it was a like or a share, even if I don't like what someone's putting out, I'll just go on and 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 do something to offer some sort of benefit to them. Yeah, I I, I know what you mean, I, and uh, I I try now that I'm sort of getting a grip of myself, and that which includes financially, <laughs> I try and do it myself. I've tried it myself. It's it's a nice thing to do because we, I think we understand how difficult it is. What's that new card? Quick draw card yeah, company, I've, Jason Tyler. Yeah, I've well, got some of them. I went, I've, yeah, I've got, well, I did the As Kickstarter. In, I yeah. put something on the Kickstarter. So, Mike, Mike Valance, mate. He, he, so Mike is, I'm sure you won't mind me saying, he, he is subscribed. He, I think he's got a subscription with Contact Coffee. Yeah. He gets more coffee thrown at him a month than you can shake a shitty stick at. He can't, literally, it's too much to drink. It's too much to give away. He gave me a bag earlier. Yeah, he gave me I still got the bag from last month. It's like, Jesus Christ. Yeah, but, got- he hasn't turned the subscription off because it's he it's he likes to he just likes to support the yeah. rich community and uh, mate, there's people out out there. It's, it's amazing and yeah. and like you said, he only knows about that through other other military people who have you know talked or promoted contact coffee and their presence on social media. Same as I, the only reason I have donated to a quick uh, quick draw car company on Kickstarter is because. I was exposed to them by Jason Tyler on Instagram. I was yeah. like, fucking, that's cool. Otherwise, I might never have seen him. Like you said, mate, yeah. we've got to support each other. One of the big things, I think, uh, one of the big lessons I've learned, I learned it initially from a guy called Nick McCarthy. Nick McCarthy is two power. He runs a two power. He runs a company up in, a uh, close protection training company and operational up in Durham called Argus Europe. One of the things I learned from him really early on is, it, it, he works obviously in the security and investigations industry, and that is a it is ruthless. I don't know if you've ever been involved with it. It is ruthless, mate. Uh, and uh, arguably the worst end of it is sort of the door, door, uh, you know, working the doors. Like those companies yeah. work the doors. It is ruthless. They are they will stab you in the back before you have even done a full one eighty away from them, right? As in proverbially, proverbially. And one of the things that uh, Nick does is. And one of the things he's exposed to, again, we're quite entrepreneurial. Lots of military get out and they set up security or investigations companies. And Nick has the attitude that he, he will help them. He, as in, he will help them with knowledge and, 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 and uh, knowledge and information and point in the right direction to... And these are competitor companies on paper, right? Obviously, Argus Europe is very established. But he will help them nonetheless, even though they're competitors. Because... And, and also, he will refer work to them. If he gets work, so this is one of the things that happens again, especially on the door, the door work end of the scale, which um, Nick doesn't deal with, but it generally costs security industries. Let's say I am company B, you know, and I and I get some work thrown at me. I can't do it. I haven't got the people to put on it. Or I haven't got capacity, and I have to turn it away. They turn that work away. They don't. What Nick does is he will go. I can't do that, but I know a company that can, and he will refer that client who he could get money for and he's and he'll point them to a different company has the same capabilities as, capabilities as nick in terms of um you know manpower and stuff but as perhaps at that time able to fulfill it where nick either can't or doesn't want to and he'll pass it on to them so that rival company right is going to get benefit from that in terms of money they're going to get a client from it but nick does that anyway and the reason he does it is because it's to, better to have positive interaction with your enemies, not that you describe them as enemies, then okay, negative, yeah, yeah. then negative. Because when it is, it impacts you, again, that relationship with the competitors in your market, but it also, it's, it demonstrates the kind of, the kind of organization you are to a client, potential clients. And you're always a positive thing. I, one of the things I took away from that, just on a personal level is, I, um, I always, when, again, when I left the military, I decided that 
and it was over time. It was, it was like a learning. And I thought, well, that's that's the way to be. If someone comes to me with a problem or a query or a question, always end it on a positive. I, no, mate, I don't. I sorry, I can't. I don't know anyone that does roofing, for example. Yeah. I don't know anyone that's got a, um, you know, a X license or this or that, or whatever. But I know someone who might know someone, and I'll refer them on to someone else who might know. It, so it all it's negative. No, I can't help you. Positive. Yeah, I'm going to give you this little referral or something and try and point you in the right direction because it's just beneficial, right? And it, yeah. then you are a positive thing. Whether it's an organization acting like that or an individual, it's good for yourself. It's a, it's a really philanthropic thing to, a way to behave. Um, and also, it benefits other people, whether it's a military person or whether or organization, whether it's not. It, but it breeds positivity around whatever you're involved with and positivity attracts positivity yeah and, and we're trying to you know I'm, I'm desperately trying and i think a lot of people in my immediate community are trying to get away from this old adage of you know people in the military are mad bad and dangerous to know i think um i there's people that that i, I try to sort of associate myself that are quietly trying to undermine that that um, idea and of course there are people out there that are, are very loudly sort of demonstrating that they actually fit into that demograph and i and it's something that it's not helpful being negative and we're all negative sometimes and we can't help it because we're only human but we've got to find a way of 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 um of just trying to inject positivity rather than negativity and i think that you know particularly helping other organizations whether they're your competitor or not i think that's a that's a that's an excellent way to operate well look at the podcast world right look how many military podcasts there are starting up now but what you won't see oh, sorry you what you will what you see is not uh it's hard to explain it's hard to explain what you see is i will share granite zero stuff I'll share declassified stuff. I, I don't refuse to engage with them and they don't refuse to engage with me because, and in inverted commas, we're competitors. Because we're not, we're all doing different things. But in terms of the business or the, the endeavor that we're doing, it's all podcasts. And our, our sort of audience or potential audience, all the same kind of audience when you start out as military, it's going to be a military, it's going to be a military audience. So instead of looking at it like, oh, I'm not going to help them. I'm not going to like this or share this or retweet this because... And that's going to impact my audience. No, no, no. Do it because we're all in the same, we're all in the same sort of battle together, and 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 better to align like that. When I was when I was uh, I spoke to a business again, ran, like random business learnings and, and insights. I was wandering through Stratford upon Avon, and I went into a jeweller's. Uh, I was looking for something specific for a business. Oddly enough, a friend with a business, and on this street, there's like there's a there's a it was a jeweller's. It was a jeweller's opposite, and there was an and, he, and we were talking. He said, "Oh, yeah, there's, a, there's another jeweler that opened up the road. I said, That's a bit of a nightmare, isn't it?" And he said, "Nah." He said, "It's not a nightmare." He said, "Because the more jewelers open up in this road, then this road becomes the place to go for jewelers. So the footfall increases for everyone. Yeah, they're going to take some sales as other jewelers, but we're all there's going to be more footfall on you. Footfall on yours. It benefits us all. Power to the people. Bring all the jewelers here." He was saying, and I thought, "Fucking hell! What a way to look at it." What a way to look at it. Really insightful. They're bang on. It's one of the reasons why you get estate agents on the same bloody street in the, in the city. You, you go into a city or a town, you get like, you often get the fast food places all on the one street. You get the estate agents all on the one street. You get the solicitors all on the one street, don't you? Why? Because that's the street to go for the solicitors, solicitors well, the estate agents. I always equate it to like the, the Galapagos Islands. Because the Galapagos Islands is a protected waters. So nobody can go fishing there. You can't go hunting there. And so what happens? You get um, an an uplift in the amount of of fish and animals that um, that that live and breed there. So they're kind of like the Galapagos Islands in my eyes. It's kind of a bit like a false multiplier, isn't it? And I try to treat uh, Winchester, where I live, as the Galapagos Islands for Thomas Parcher's shoes. So if it's doing well in Winchester, people that leave and then come back again, they're taking that message with them and saying, oh, yeah, Thomas Parcher's shoes. It's it's associated with Winchester and we love it. And it's our, it's the company that comes from Winchester because obviously most shoes come from Northampton. 
um, and it's our brand. And you are a Wintonian, which is the posh word for people that come from Winchester. Um, w- if you were Win- Tom's part, Wintonian or Winchonian? A Wintonian. Why is it not Winchonian? <laughs> God knows. It's probably some because I don't know. I don't know. Someone who's really clever can answer that question, but um, because not many people know this, but Winchester was the ancient capital of England, and I always drop that into the conversation. But but no one knows. Must be after Colchester. Colchester was the first recorded. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. Oh no, Colchester was the first recorded town. Yeah, I don't know if it was the first capital though. Um, Because King Alfred the Great was the first. I think he he kind of united the English tribes, and he's. I think his great grandson was the first actual king of england anyway um there's lots of cool stuff in winchester like you'll go past you'll go just walk down the street and on a plaque there'll be uh william the conqueror had his palace here and to think that i'm walking in the same footsteps as william the conqueror is like that blows my mind a little bit because it's quite a, a cool place which nobody knows it if i say i'll come from winchester they'll go they'll look at me strangely and go where's that and I go, oh, it's in between Basingstoke and Southampton. They go, oh, yeah, I know. Bas- Basingstoke and where? Southampton. Okay. I know where Southampton is. Yeah. So no, it's down the M3. I, I, I struggled with the exactly. South. Exactly. Who would, it's down the M3. I was, uh, I was in a random conversation with, uh, with Johnny Mercer yesterday. And uh, I love his hair at the moment. <laughs> I know. Uh, random conversation with Johnny Mercer yesterday. And he said, I was having some banter. And he said, he's not about Plymouth. He's Plymouth, go back and forth to Plymouth, London. And he said, he said, do you, he said, do you even know the motorways that go from Plymouth to London? I said, yeah, the M3 is one of them, I'm sure of it. Maybe, <laughs> maybe probably. And then I looked this morning, I was like, nah. Nah, it's the 303 <laughs> and the M5, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, the M5, that's right, the M5 is the M3. M3 goes to Southampton, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, okay. So that goes from the M25 down to Southampton. Uh, yeah. And then the A34 goes up, the other way, so I came the A34 today, and then the 303, that's one way to get to the south, you know, the, to the west country, or the M, M5, M4, M5. Anyway, I don't know why we're talking about that. But. Yeah, this is, people are switching off. We're talking about fucking Winchester and their motorways. What are we doing? <laughs> we're talking about the Galapagos <laughs> Islands. It's gone off the quality of the conversation, it's gone yeah. off a cliff. Uh, who's involved with Mike Arthur then? Just you and, just you and Andy? Yeah, just me and Andy pushing that, and, and, um, it, it, like I said, it is a labour of love at the moment, and um, um, you know I know Andy's put he's put a lot of time and effort and finance into into Mike Alpha, um, and you know like I said, we want it to be a success. We really, really do. We want more people, to obviously, to find out about it and and go over to the website, which is Mike Alpha, or it's Mike Mike hyphen Alpha dot com, I think. Um, and to, you know, to jump on some of the courses and, and particularly the webinars, I was gutted yesterday. I, I was a bit crushed yesterday because only nine people turned up to the to the webinar yesterday. Um, it happens, though, mate. It I happens. Know. It's and so hit and miss. I did a Patreon Zoom calls, and sometimes, well, every time there's only been a few people. But then, in reality, those kind of things, especially now, you, you're gonna get it. Especially yeah. the people that say, "Yeah, I'm going on the Facebook." Yeah, yeah. The, They're gonna get a fraction of them actually turn up. It's just one of those no, pills you've got to swallow, haven't you? And it is, and, and it's kind of like. Um, it's a learning curve, mate. Night, mate. A small amount of people is not a drama either, especially when you're starting off, because you, you, it's much easier. It's you get a much more effective personal connection with those people. It's again going back to the Patreon calls that I do. The next one's on Tuesday. If three or four people turn up, man, I'm having direct conversation with those three or four people. If I get all twenty, twenty eight, twenty nine, my Patreons turn up, it's still going to be really beneficial. But in terms of like really interpersonal connections with specific individuals i don't get that opportunity as well both are good loads of people are not uh, each one have their positives so when there's not a lot of people it's still yeah i mean i mean actually there's one guy that i really wanted to push on onto that course because i don't know if i mentioned but a bloke called dan richards he's um uh just an amazing bloke who he was um in the artillery i think it was in king's troop um managed to rip off his arm on whilst he was on a motorbike Oh my god! Yeah, how did he manage that? He came off his motorbike and and lost his arm, his right arm. Um, however, he's really come a long way in in the in the years that um, that he's been injured, and 
Um, he's now into a lot of body confidence stuff, helping other people with their, with, with issues that they've got. Um, he's now doing a, a bit of male modeling. Um, and his main message is all, you know, is about kind of like almost being satisfied with what you've got, um, and being comfortable in your own skin. Um, and when he was on the, on the, um, on the national lottery advert I did, and he was part of that as well. And, and because he was used to that kind of world, he basically, for want of a better word, held my hand through the whole of that um, that experience for me because I'd never I'd never done it before. Um, and you mean I, you mean it's like production, fil- yeah, film production, right? yeah, all that all that kind of stuff. And he was kind of used to it a little bit, and um, he was he was great. So with Dan, I'll always try and help Dan because um, you know I've got such a lot of time for him. And he was on the call yesterday, and he'd he'd kind of sacked off LinkedIn and the trainer. And I know she, like, she's all over it. Kanita from, from Jellyfish, she's all over it. So, so yesterday was a LinkedIn specific seminar yeah. delivered by Mark Alfa. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it was, it was all about uh, LinkedIn advocacy for employees. And, um, and she was, she really sort of turned his, his perception of LinkedIn because it is changing. It is pretty much more like a, a Facebook for business owners, really. Um, and cause he'd come off where he, he's kind of sacked it a little bit, didn't really understand the, the, the platform at all. And it was just tweaking what he's doing to fit in with what he's doing, you know, cause you might start a journey on your own, but you'll soon on, on that journey, you'll still start bumping into people that are along the same lines as you, as you are. And, um, and you know, so he's was in the military, but that's not his life anymore. There's actually no point in on LinkedIn being mates or, or, or connecting with people that are still in the military. Cause that's not where his life is anymore. Um, he needs to be sort of connecting with photographers, directors, agencies, anybody that books a model for a show. That's the kind of person that he should be connecting with. Actually, it still suits me to connect with people that are still serving and are leaving purely for Mike Alpha. So, although I'm not in the military and I haven't been in really effectively since 2009, although I didn't leave until th- 2014, but um, I wasn't really a serve. I wasn't a soldier whilst I was rehabbing. I was just a broken bloke for a while, um, getting lots of surgery and, and living the dream down at Headley Court. And that was a, I mean, the humour there, that's another conversation though, but um, yeah, so it's all about swapping worlds and he swapped his world very, very effectively. And what he's doing is, is, you know, hats off to him. He's an amazing bloke and, and one that, you know, I wish him the best because he's a, he's a good guy. He really is. Mate. Um, Headley Court. What was the, what was the, the civilian community who lived in that area? Cause I've never, have I been there? I've, I've been there once. I remember taking a mate of mine, Stu Hale down. I don't know if you met Stu. No, you, you might have met Stu as Hale at some point. Maybe not. He's a flipping, He's a bloody, uh, what do you call it? He's the hermit now. Rarely leaves his little shop. He's got his mega bloke. I think I dropped him off there once. I, I can't remember. What was the civilian community like around Headley Court? To, in, in term, just in their interaction with you guys? Well, actually, like Headley Court was in literally the middle of nowhere. Right. Um, and if you look at a map, it's actually not that far from the M25. You know, you could probably walk there across a field and be there in about, 10, 15 minutes, if you could be bothered to do that. Um, so obviously we weren't far from Leather- Leatherhead. We weren't far from Dorkin. Um, there's a race. I can't remember the racetrack that's up there. Um, but there was a few pubs up there where, where you know, people used to knock about at. There was um, a steakhouse that was not far. So although we is didn't... Ascot? Yeah. Is, yeah, it, so, is it Ascot? Yeah, that's it. Is, it. is it Ascot? Yeah, yeah Ascot. Yeah, okay. Um so, although we didn't necessarily have a, a huge amount to do with the local population, and there was a what was the, I can't even remember the pub that was up the road, but we did, you know, the pub. Everybody used to go to the pub, um, but Headley Court for me, I was there for four and a half years, off and on, um, and so my time at Headley Court. I mean, I got there on the eighth of December two thousand nine, and I was blown up on the twenty sixth of October. I was walking less than two months after I was injured, albeit in beset of bars and you know i wasn't allowed to take my legs home but i've got a picture of myself stood up in my prosthetic legs with a massive smile on my face 
um, knowing that actually there was, I was going to get back on my feet, metaphorically and, you know, almost physically. Um, but Headley Court for me was a cycle of um, obviously rehab, physiotherapy, smashing yourself in the gym, um, learning to walk again, and then some time off to either go on holiday, have surgery, have children, or you'd be waiting an extra bit of time because it was so busy there. You'd be waiting for a space to go back in again because they needed to get other blokes, other men and women, other men and women into the place to get treated. Um, I mean, it was, it was a, it was an awesome place to be. The, the, the humor there was, I mean, we were, we were, we, we thought we were very funny and we were, and I actually remember a bunch of baby powers coming in with, um, with a young subaltern, young lieutenant, lieutenant. And, uh, they were sort of, it was, it was so funny to watch because, you know, a young a group of paras on their own would normally be able to dominate a space and and be the life and soul of of whichever t- place they took up well they were completely out of water in Headley court and we were sat there and we were just and they were like it was almost like a couple of rabbits in the headlights and i was sat there with some of my mates and you know all knocking about with no legs and arms missing and bits and pieces and um these guys walked past and they were looking a bit sheepish and i went look at these fuckers showing off with their legs but loud enough that they could hear <laughs> L- loud enough that they could hear and my mate he was a captain in uh, the rifles he was just like he was like howling at what I just said and these guys just their faces just went red like with embarrassment all of them and then their you know their their, their platoon commander uh, he, he kind of walked past with a, just smiling at our this is it's really interesting to say that I was talking to um, I was on the reorg podcast last week yeah it was last week and um one of the things i spoke about in there was in 2006 when we came back from that first herrick four tour again Stu halo i mentioned just now um now i hadn't been around i hadn't had much experience being around um military people who had had catastrophic injuries like yourself like Stu had. and when i came back from that tour I, we are we were then mega mega close um and I found it, I, I wanted to avoid going to see him when I came back because I didn't know how to treat him at that point. I didn't know how to deal with it, you know. And as I said on the on the Reorg podcast, you deal with it in the way you would deal with anything when you're in the military. When we rocked up, there was awkwardness, you know. I, I well, I felt, you know, awkward. There was a few of us there. I, was like, Fuck, I, didn't, you know, I, just didn't, I did not know what to say, how to treat him or what. And as time went on, I realised, no, it's, it's still stew. It's still say, you just fucking treat him like one of the blokes. And we were just, again, that humour. You would have been like, lucky. You I mean, just go, there's no, there's, there's no holes barred. And, uh, and so for those baby paras, mate, they, again, they have got no experience really being around that, that, that situation and finding, and just it being normal, being around people with catastrophic injuries and how to handle it. And again, the reality is just, it's just normal. Slag them off. Ah, stew hail gets I beasted mean, even now. You know, we used to, t- I mean, there was all sorts there. There's engineers, there's paras, there's marines. Um, there was um, obviously Gurkhas there, and then a lot of rifles. So there was there was one or two REMC, and then you know there'll be a few of like one or two other different cat badges. But predominantly, it was anyway. You come, you become like a bastard son of all of those people. So you start talking about wets and brews, and I'd sit there. I'd say, oh, I'd be mates with a Royal Marine. And he'd say, oh, do you want a wet? I said, I'm not qualified for wet, but can I have a brew, please? And, you know, and then, uh, you know, we just became, our even our language changed as a result of being in this different culture because it was a culture purely based on Headley Court, not on the, on the wider military. Um, and it was just a very funny environment to be in. And sometimes it was cruel, but hilariously cruel, you know. I mean, some of the stuff we got up to was just... Come on, spill the beans. Give me one story. Give me um, one horrendous story. I remember... Between friends. Just, it's just you and I talking. No one else is listening. No, nobody else is listening. Um, <laughs> let me think of something that's... I guess you can say anything on your... Just, listen, change the names. <laughs> change the names. <laughs> so I remember... I mean, this is pretty tame, but w- people like... And this is one of those things where you're not sure it happened or not. It turned into a duty rumour. 
They're the best. They're the best. They're, the, they're, the they're best. these urban myths that like actually were true. So I came back one, and this is I'm going to completely. Then there's going to be no names. I'm going to pretend it might not have even happened. But supposedly there are some of the guys. They've got um, all the fire extinguishers, and they basically. They hadn't strapped them to their wheelchairs, but they had them on their wheelchairs and they were firing themselves. Up. They, they were setting the wheelchairs off and using them as rockets. <laughs> I can believe that. And I can believe that. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, there was another case where, you know, we were getting prosthetic legs and we were getting some of the newest, newest legs going. And uh, if you happen to be there on an intake where you were getting given these legs and then one of the guys wasn't, using his legs at all and some of the other amputees uh, weren't happy about this because he just it, it it had them fitted to his, his his sockets and they were just sat by his bed so again the story went um that his wheelchair was taken and one wheel was up a flagpole one wheel was up in the in the uh, uh in the full ceiling so it'd been put up into the full ceiling and the body of his wheelchair was at the bottom of the pool to encourage him to use his legs so you might think, oh, that's really cruel, but the, 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 actually it was from a position of encouragement to use what he'd been given. Because these things, like, he'd been given, like, 100 grand's worth of, of, of leg, and he wasn't using them. Um, and it was, a, it was the, the Headley Court version of encouragement. <laughs> yeah, it sounds, it, sounds, it sounds good. And that may or may not have happened. Yeah. <laughs> Right, are we are we still going open water swimming? Oh, if you want to, mate. Well, I've not done it before, right? Um, and but I, I'm getting I'm getting into swimming in a pool, but in the temperature, I've got a shortly. Yeah, I'll be fine. Uh, I mean, wet suit. You know, I won't tease you at all. I mean, I judge people now if they get in. <laughs> in so I was swimming in the summer when I could get out swim, and I see people getting in wetsuits. So I'm going, it's the summer. The only reason you're wearing a wetsuit in the summer. Is because you want the benefits of the buoyancy, so you can smash it up in the water. You're not getting in there because you're cold. You're being there because you want to big time it and you want to be swimming. So I'll get in. I hadn't thought of that. The buoyancy. Yeah, you get a huge amount of buoyancy. Um, so I've been swimming. You know, it, it makes me laugh a little bit with the. So I say to people, I'm doing open water swimming and I'm doing cold water swimming, and they go, "Do you go in with wetsuit?" I say, "No, no, no, I don't go in with wetsuit. I won't wear mine then. No. I've got I've got some shorts in the car. Yeah." I can't explain like the benefits of what I get from being in the cold water, but I know for a fact, well, there's three things. I haven't had a cold or a cough since I've started doing it, which is over a year. Um, my mental health has improved immeasurably. And, um, and this counts for men and women, but my li- my libido is um, something that really annoys my wife and which I'm, which pleases me no end. So, for me, you, libido, yeah, as in sex, sex drive, drive. yeah. <laughs> Walk. I, I feel like a, I feel like a seventeen-year-old again, you know. Anyway, how old are you now? Forty-four, mate. Brilliant. Keep it going. Keep it going. So, hey, are you going to be one of those seventy-year-olds who's popping out kids? No, mate. Oh, I'm, you won't be popping out. I've only got, will. <laughs> I mean, I've only got one. I've only got one one ball left after the other one got blown off. <laughs> But, uh, and I think I need to put a fucking nail. Mate, even your ball is licked. It's like, oh my God. Yeah, it should like, be two of us. And doing, I'm doing double the work and I haven't got a muck of G. Do you know what I said to, <laughs> I said to my wife the other day? I said to her, oh, I've got a plan. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to get my sperm quietly, uh, frozen and I only want it used in a hundred years time so my great grandchildren can meet my kids. And I thought that was highly amusing, but my wife didn't. Mate, you're an anyway. animal. You're an animal, Simon. Right, let's do it then. Because I listen, it does not appeal to me. It does not it doesn't appeal It doesn't appeal to me, to me either. But I like to put myself up in my comfort zone. <laughs> I do, okay. I do I like I I wanna do it regularly. I was doing it regularly, as in daily. I had this thing where I'd get up when I was sort of when I was really starting to take note of my mental state because I, I was on the back end of coming out of a really a difficult time. And one of the things I, I started doing I picked it up, so I read it somewhere. I can't remember what I was doing, but I wanted to make myself feel uncomfortable every day, doing something I disliked. And that would be, for example, I hate doing the plank, right? The plank is a hard exercise, really painful. It's just, oh, it's always going to be painful, right? You know, regardless of how much you do it, 
you know, um, and so I get up in the morning and go, right, I am, I am going to do, and I'd set myself a possible, t- not impossible, super difficult. So I'm going to do 10 minutes of a plank, right? And, and in my head, I go, it doesn't matter how long it takes me and how many breaks I need. I'm doing 10 fucking minutes. Another example would be, I'm going to do 300 press-ups, mate. At the time, I couldn't do 50 press-ups in one go, right? But I'll do 300 and I'm going to do it. That is it. You're going to do it and achieve it. And again, that achievement side of things I've spoken about before. So, open water swimming. I'm back into swimming because, funny enough, I'm crap at swimming. I've always hated it. And last year I thought, right, well, if I hate it and I'm crap at it, the way to improve that is let's get better at it and start doing it. I couldn't do, I could, I couldn't do five lengths. I, mean, I couldn't even do two lengths without having to have a breather. I did, for the first time ever, I did 50 the other day. 50 in one session. I did it in like 26. No, no, I did it in 30. I was going to bluff then. I did it in 30. I didn't, if I wasn't, I did 46 in 30 minutes. I fucking get in. I was chuffed, man. I was chuffed. And, uh, and decent technique. Decent technique, I think. I've never had any lessons, but I think. But, so the open water swimming, let's do it. Why not? Yeah, I'm in. And do you know what? With the cold water, you don't have to be in there for very long. So um, I, I'm a complete minority. It's a, uh, the cold water swimming is, a, is pretty much a, a female-dominated um, sport or pastime. Um, but I, I see so many benefits. And people say to me, oh, I don't, there's no way I'm going to do that. It, you can't knock it until you try it. And I, I would suggest to anybody just to give it a go because you don't have to be in there for very long. Some people jump in and, and they will they may do a loop, which might be two minutes, and get back out again. Uh, some people stay for 10 minutes. Um, you know, My aim is to do the ice mile, which is I know how long it's going to take me, and I've got to acclimatise up to doing um, the mile um, with no so no buoyancy which obviously you get from the wetsuit, which I know is going to take me longer because I've got, because I can't use my legs. So I know. Oh, how- shit. Yeah. You can't, you, got to, you can't kick. And also because I end up sort of, your body should be flat in the water. Mine, mine sort of drags like that. So I'm now going through the water like that. So it takes me longer to do it. Is it not, have they not figured out fins or something? Yeah, but it, you can't use anything. So if I can't use it for a competition, there's no point in me using it. I see. Um, so what's the ice mile then? Ice mile, swimming obviously a mile in below five degrees. So the coldest I've got, because I was tried to do it this year, um, just didn't manage it because it wasn't cold enough. And I think the coldest I got to was 5.2 or 4. How cold was that? It's, I mean, you get this thing called the after drop, where your peripheries are cold, and then your blood, which is pulled inside your torso, has then got to go circulate back out again and it's dragging the cold back into your body so you start shivering and it's something that you've got to be aware of and got to be and and, and you've got to manage so you wouldn't be in a fit state to drive for 20 minutes um to maybe an hour and uh, you know we've got the added bonus where i swim um there's a, a sauna which probably won't be able to be used during covid um so it's about managing how long I'm in the water for um, and what I'm going to do when I get out. Because actually the easy part is being in the water almost. It's what you do when you get out of the water and how you manage yourself and how you get dry and warm again. Got yeah. You'd have to, you'd have to brief me up then when we go and do yeah. this. Yeah. Um, but we, yeah, because I'm just looking at the timings. We've been so, here for four hours, haven't we? We've been, we, it's an hour and 38. So is there anything you want to mention that we haven't mentioned? Any, any, any organisations, people, or anything you need to plug? No, I think I've pretty much covered everything, really. Give the give the Mike Alpha website again, please. So Mike Alpha, it's mike-alpha.com, um, and then Partridge Shoes, which is the which is uh, Thomas Partridge Shoes, um, and then my own website, which is simonharmer.com. Sweet, mate, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been thanks for having me, mate. Fucking hilarious as well. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Do it again. Do yeah, it again. <laughs> I mean, I'll be back up here next week. <laughs> Sweet.